It's a beautiful day. Lots of announcements in the bulletin. I encourage you to check them out. Uh, there's a lot going on in the church. Um, now as we turn our hearts and minds to worship, let's affirm our faith together by saying the Nicene Creed today, the Nicene Creed printed in the bulletin. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made for us and our salvation. He came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshiped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let us pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for our life. Thank you for the gift of this day. Thank you for granting me the breath it takes to speak this word. Thank you for the gift of relationship and relationships, the bonds we share with each other, and the awesome truth that through Christ Jesus, you offer relationship with you. Thank you for the gift of our minds, for our ability to listen, to hear, and to the extent we're able to understand. Father, thank you for your holy word. Thank you for telling us who you are through your holy word. Thank you for our experiences of you and the ability you give us to speak and write and proclaim our experience of you to others so that, so that they may also know you. Father, thank you for this beautiful sacred space and the opportunity to freely gather together here seeking you, bowing before you, worshiping you. We each came here with our own reasons in mind. You know why we are each here. Regardless of our reasons for coming, we each came the way we are. Father, please change us. 
break through our hard shell, the protection we've built around our hearts, our souls and spirits, our break through our hardened selves, break through that we may each truly see you in your glory, in your love, in your light, and just your awesomeness, and that we may that we may see who we are in comparison, that we may see our relative darkness and our lowliness, our sinfulness, and just how in desperate need we are for you. We gather here together seeking you, needing you. We truly want you in our lives, in our hearts, in our souls, in our spirits. We truly believe that the small amount of pleasure we feel from worldly pursuits is nothing close to the joy available through you. And we want you in your life and everything that comes with it. We seek you. Father, please transform us. Through Christ Jesus and the Holy Spirit, please make each of us new new hearts, new souls, new spirits, fully alive in you and through you, experiencing your life abundant, experiencing your kingdom here on earth. And we ask all this not for our mere pleasure, but so that your glory might be revealed here on earth through it and through us. Here, now, we surrender to you holy. Thank you, Christ Jesus. We know you have always been and will always be. We know you are God. We know that you are sovereign, holy, the perfect creator of everything with all power and authority everywhere. We believe. We know. We trust in our hearts. You are who you say you are. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you for filling us, surrounding us, transforming us. We breathe you in. May it all be for your glory. Thank you for all your blessings, Father. We continue praying as Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
neat instruments. I thought that was wonderful. Pastor Sandy is away today with the Kairos ministry, and she asked me to come share with you, so that's why I'm here. I think we have someone else coming to join us in just a minute. This last week, we had some special days that, with names that you might not have understood. Tuesday was Mardi Gras, and that's a French word for Fat Tuesday. And people had parties and parades and wore costumes and threw beads, and they were just generally kind of crazy. But then the very next day, come join me, the very next day was Ash Wednesday, and all over the world, millions of Christians had a cross drawn on their forehead in ashes that were made from the palm branches that we waved last Palm Sunday that had been burned into ashes. That was Ash Wednesday. Today is the first Sunday in Lent, and that's L-E-N-T, not L-I-N-T, which is that fuzzy white stuff that your mom gets out of the clothes dryer. But L-E-N-T is a season of the church year when we think about what Jesus did for us when he lived on earth and when he died on the cross. It's a serious time for some serious thinking about some serious things. Pastor Clinton is going to preach today about a word that you may not have heard before very often called salvation. Let's think about the root of salvation. It means to save. I'll bet you have some things that you save. Do you like to save Marvel action heroes or Disney princesses or any of those kind of plush toys maybe? Your parents might say to you, save your allowance or save your birthday money so you can buy some neat things. That's one way of saving. But there's another way of saving that's even more important. Veterinarians often save the lives of our pets. Do you have pets? Do you have a dog or a kitty? Or Yeah. So if your pets get hurt or ill, the veterinarians can take care of them and save their lives. Doctors and nurses and paramedics often save the lives of people. And sometimes, soldiers and firefighters and police save the lives of others, but they lose their own lives. That's what Jesus did. He loved us so much that he saved our lives, but he lost his own. So during these 40 days of Lent, we talk and sing about Jesus as our Savior. You may have heard that word before. But our Savior died for us. It makes us sad that Jesus had to die. So some of our songs and our stories are sad, and that's okay. But whenever you're sad that Jesus died, remember that he loved us so much that he wanted to give his life just so he could save us. So how could we not love Jesus? Would you say a little prayer with me? Would you repeat after me? Lord Jesus, thank you for loving us and saving us. Help us to love you more. Amen. Thank you.
the offertory prayer printed in the bulletin. Giving God, bless our gifts with your mercy and your grace. Shine through our tithes and offerings with your light and love so that our ministries here at FUMCT may be a sign of light and love to others. Amen.
Gospel according to Luke, verses 39 through 43. One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said, since you are under the same sentence? We are punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus answered him, I tell you the truth, today you will be with me in paradise. The word of God for the people of God. Good morning. We continue our Lenten series that we commenced last Wednesday, Ash Wednesday. And during Lent this year, we'll be looking at the seven sayings, the seven cross sayings, the seven last words of Jesus from the cross. On Ash Wednesday, uh, we talked about the first word, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. The word of forgiveness. Next Sunday, we're going to be looking at the third word, which is the word of affection from John, the 19th chapter, verses 26 and 27, where Jesus says, Woman, behold your son. Son, behold your mother. Today, from the verses that Danielle read for us, we want to look at the second saying, the word of salvation, the word of salvation. Uh, friends, we can rejoice and be thankful for God forgives us of our sins through Jesus. The scene of our pericope is ugly. It is Good Friday. The setting now moves to Calvary, Golgotha, the place of death by crucifixion. Jesus' Palm Sunday festive entry into Jerusalem is behind us. Jesus' prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane, where agony gets the best of him, is behind us. The Roman soldiers arrest Jesus coming out of Gethsemane and Judas betrays him with the kiss is behind us. Jesus' other 11 disciples abandon him is behind us. Peter denies that he knows Jesus three times and then he weeps bitterly when the cock crows for the third time is behind us. <clears throat> Jesus walks the Via Dolorosa, the 14 stations of the cross, as he drags his cross to the crucifixion is behind us. Jesus goes through a kangaroo trial where they lead him through four courts and six trials and he cannot find justice in either one is behind us. The Roman soldiers turn Jesus over to Pontius Pilate for crucifixion. Mrs. Pilate has a dream and urges her husband to have nothing to do with this innocent Jesus is behind us. They blindfold and play games with Jesus. They throw dice to decide who gets his clothes. They beat him severely. Pilate tells his bailiffs to bring him some water so he can wash his hands free of the blood of Jesus is behind us. They make the sign of serene. Have Jesus bear his rugged cross up Calvary's hill, and the hymn is asked in song, must Jesus bear the cross alone? And all the world go free. No, there's a cross for everyone. There's a cross for me. 
between two criminals to meet the end of their lives. They pierced Jesus' hands and feet with nails. Friends, Jesus now looks like a pitiful king, a defeated monarch who loses his kingdom. So, so Calvary this morning is a reminder for us of what Jesus does for us. Have you ever thought about it that Jesus never tell us to remember his joyful birth? Jesus never tells us to remember his joyful birth, but Jesus does tell us to remember his painful death on Calvary. I like the way the hymnist puts it. King of my life, I crown thee now. Thine shall the glory be. Lest I forget thy thorn crowned brow, lead me to Calvary. So on Golgotha's hill, on Calvary, Jesus shares his torture, his pain, his raw suffering with two other criminals. Verses 32 and 33 say, two others, both criminals, were led out to be executed with Jesus. And finally, they came to a place called the skull. All three were crucified there. Jesus on the center cross and two criminals on either side. So here's the picture. Three men hang on three crosses at Calvary. Two criminals and one innocent victim. Now notice, their crucifixion is the same. Their pain is similar, but their cause is diverse. One dies in sin, one dies to sin, and one dies for sin. One dies in sin, one dies to sin, and one dies for sin. So Jesus hangs in the middle of these two thieves. And some scholars says not only are they thieves, but they are butchers. So Jesus stands in the middle of these two thieves, Dismas and Gestas. Now, the Bible does not name these two thieves. However, in the Gospel of Nicodemus, you've heard in the Apocrypha, the lost books of the Bible, which biblical scholars date to the fourth century AD, and they name the repentant thief Dismas and the thief who mocks Jesus, Gestus. The Roman Catholic Church canonizes and celebrates Dismas as a saint. So on March 25th, they celebrate Saint Dismas with the feast. So this morning, to understand this word of salvation, three crosses I wanna lift up for us to remember and I'm through. Remember, I says one dies in sin, one dies to sin, and one dies for sin. There's the three crosses. So let's look at these three crosses, and I'm through. First, the cross of rebellion. Now, this is the cross of Gestas, the thief who mocks, who makes fun of Jesus. And this cross is to the left of Jesus. Now, this thief, Gestas, is a bitter, shameless criminal. And even the gravity of death does not silence the blasphemy from his lips. He hears Jesus pray for forgiveness for those who crucify him. And still, this thief has no remorse and continues to hurl insults at Jesus. He chooses he chooses to spend his last moments 
mocking Jesus. He tells Jesus, aren't you the king? And if you are the king, I want you to prove it. I want you to prove that you are the Messiah. Verse 39 says, then one of the criminals hanging there began to yell insults at Jesus. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and then save us. Friends, when life gives us a cross, it is easy to become bitter. It is easy to become bitter when life gives us a cross. And often we are bitter with Jesus because Jesus does not take our cross away from us. You remember the Apostle Paul? How Paul has a thorn in his flesh. Paul has a cross. And he asks God, he prays to God three times to remove his thorn, his cross. But notice what God says in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9. I'm not going to remove your thorn. I'm not going to take away your cross. But my grace is sufficient for you and my power works best in your weakness. So then, let us focus on how we respond rather than focus on the cross. How we respond rather than the cross. A young man is at the end of his rope and seeing no way out, he prays, Lord, I can't go on. I have too heavy a cross to bear. And the Lord says, my son, if you can't bear his weight, just place your cross inside this room. Then open that other door and pick out any cross you wish. And the man is filled with relief. And he says, thank you, Lord. He sighs and then he does as he is told. And when he enters the other door, he sees many crosses, some so large that the tops are not visible. Then he spots a tiny cross that leans against the far wall. And the young man whispers, Lord, I like that one. And the Lord says, my son, that is the cross you just brought in. A cross is not as bad as we believe. In her life, then her illness, and subsequent her death. My dear, my mother told me this, that our cross is not as bad as we believe. So in spite of our crosses, God says to each one of us, my grace, is still sufficient. So let us not be like Gestus, the thief to the left of Jesus. Lord, why do you allow this to happen? Aren't you God? Aren't you the savior? Aren't you the healer? Aren't you the deliverer? Aren't you the one who makes bitter experiences sweet? Then God, why don't you do something about this? Friends, regardless of our cross, always remember, not only is it not as bad as we believe, but God is still God. In spite of our crosses, God says to each one of us this morning, my grace is still sufficient. So let us trust God. The wise man Solomon says in Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, trust in the Lord with all of our heart. Do not depend on our own understanding. Seek God's will in all we do, and he will show us which path to take. Second, the cross of repentance. Now, this is the cross of Dismas, the thief who turns to Jesus. And this cross is to the right of Jesus. Now, now this dying thief, he's remorseful. He hears Jesus pray in verse 34 for those who crucify him. Father, forgive them, 
for they know not what they do. Notice that's the first word Jesus utters from the cross. Amidst all of the torture, amidst all of the pain, Father, just forgive them. They don't know what they do. So Jesus' prayer breaks his heart. Have you ever noticed that at Calvary, really and truly throughout his life, but at Calvary, Jesus never defends himself? Think about that. At Calvary, in a moment of bitter agony, Jesus never defends himself. But Dismas, this dying thief does, he rebukes Gestus, the other dying thief, and he asks Jesus to do something for him. Dismas says, you know, we deserve to die for our crimes, for what we've done. But this man hasn't done anything wrong. And then he turns to Jesus. Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Never waste the experience of a cross. This is how I embrace it. If I have to go through it, I'm gonna get something out of it. And so I tell each one of us, never waste the experience of a cross, a bad situation. If we have to go through it, let's get something out of it. So Dismas, the thief on the right of Jesus, bears the cross of repentance. And I submit to you this morning, what an exercise of faith. Jesus dies on the cross. They put that, that sign over him, they argue over, this is the king of the Jews. Jesus dies. Looks like his kingdom is over. But notice, notice, on Good Friday, this dying repentant thief, has, he exercises his faith. He watches and he waits. And friends, I want to submit, he has the greatest faith. The disciples run away, right? Others watch the crucifixion and they doubt Jesus. Listen to him in Luke 24, 21. We thought, we were hoping that he was the one who had come to redeem Israel. But this dying thief, this repentant dying thief, friends, he has an active faith. And this leads me to say, let's never count anyone out. We never know how God is working with someone. Some, some biblical commentators, it says, a lot of people get upset with this thief. He didn't serve on any committees in the church. No record of his being baptized. No record of him walking down the aisle of the church. Never count out anyone. We never know how God is working with someone. But this repentant thief, others watch hoping that Jesus was the one. But look at him, he turns not to the victors, but to the victim. He looks beyond the mockery of Jesus, beyond his thorn crowned brow, beyond his pierced side, beyond his nailed feet, beyond all of his blood. And he sees a savior and he simply says, Lord, when you come into your kingdom, I want you to just to remember me we, we, we know the hymn that says the dying thief rejoiced to see that fountain in his day. And there may I, though vile as he, wash all my sins away. And because of his repentance and because of his faith, that day, Good Friday, Jesus put brakes on death and says, death, you in too big of a hurry. 
And Jesus takes this man's soul and sails it on to the sea of eternity. And Jesus tells the angels, wait tables on him. I'll be home at three o'clock this afternoon. And Jesus looks at the dying thief and says, today, not tomorrow, not next week, not next year, but today you will be with me in paradise. And there's a lot of discussion, a lot of debate. What does Jesus mean by being with me in paradise? Jeremiah, talked to, Jeremiah and I talked about it this week. Clinton, how are you gonna deal with paradise? Well, the more I looked at paradise, today you will be with me in paradise. The more I looked at it, it dawned on me that the two important words are with me. That's the two most important words. Today you will be with me in paradise. And driving to church this morning, I thought about it. Have you ever gotten in somewhere because of somebody else? And they let you in because you know someone else? Yeah. So Jesus says, today you will be with me, with Jesus in paradise. And that leads me to believe in paradise, safe where Jesus is, because wherever Jesus is, that's paradise. Will the Lord remember me when I am called to go? When I've crossed death's chilly sea, will he his love there show? Oh yes, he heard my feeble cries. From bondage he sets me free. And when I reach the pearly gates, he will remember me. And third and finally, not only the cross of rebellion, not only the cross of repentance, but third and finally, the cross of redemption. Now friends, here we tread on holy ground because the man on the middle cross is Jesus. You see, they convict Jesus of a crime he never commits. Jesus' enemies examines his life thoroughly and they say yet they find no flaw because you know what the Bible says, Jesus did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. But they convict an innocent Jesus of a crime he never commits. And Dismas, the repentant thief says to the other criminal first, you know, we deserve to die for our crimes. We're getting what we deserve, but this man has done nothing wrong. And then he turns to Jesus. Now, Lord, when you come to your kingdom, I still believe in you. You're still the king. And when you come into your kingdom, I want you to remember, just remember me. You see, evil does its worst to Jesus on Calvary. But notice how Jesus responds. He responds <coughs> with forgiveness. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And then he responds with salvation. Today you will be with me in paradise. So Jesus dies to give us love that we do not deserve, forgiveness we desperately need, and salvation we must have. So Jesus dies on the middle cross, on Calvary, on Golgotha, and he does it for our sins. And friends, this is the good news of Lent. We can rejoice because Jesus dies on the cross for our sins. He that knew no sin became sin for us so that we can become the righteousness of God. And it all happens on a cross. The cross, a bloody romance between heaven and earth. The cross, a human mirror of God's love. The cross, heaven's medicine for earth's chronic sickness. The cross, heaven's remedy for earth's confusion. The cross, heaven's pardon for earth's sins. The cross, heaven's forgiveness for earth's guilt. The cross, heaven's joy for earth's sorrow. The cross, heaven's hope for earth's despair. The cross, heaven's triumph for earth's disaster. Jesus dies until heaven is satisfied. Earth is justified and sinners are sanctified. And it all happens on and at the cross. And we can rejoice. 
You hear the hymnist at the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light and the burden of my heart rolled away, for it was there by faith I received my sight, and now I'm happy. I'm happy. I'm happy all the day because Jesus died to take away my sins, past, present, and future. And Jesus secures our salvation on and at the cross. Lord, remember us. Lord, remember us. And all of God's people said, if you'd like to make a decision this morning to follow Christ, become a part of our church family, or to pray at the altar, we invite you to come. While we stand and sing our closing hymn 527, Do Lord Remember Me. <clears throat>